Hello everyone, it's Yintan here, and given that it's been nearly an entire month since I last put out a news video, I figure it's best to take an extensive look around New Eden to give a brief overview on all of the little flashpoints and conflicts that dot the map as 2019 draws to a close, whilst we wait for the geographic situation to better reflect the political one as various groups are either currently moving coalition, attempting to annex new territory, or looking at options for their future. We're going to cut to the chase as well and eschew our normal starting point in the due north, and start with the area that's been the focus of Eve's great powers for the past six months or so in the southeast, starting with the regions at the roughly four o'clock position, Cash. This is the region that Winter Coalition were forced to retreat to after their front in Detorid finally gave way just two months ago as a result of their war with Legacy and Fi.re, which escalated as a result of the Imperium often aiding Legacy and Fi.re, whilst Panfam and Winter blued one another to form the Pandafam group to fight against these forces. Whilst this war has not, as far as I'm aware, officially ended, with my contacts in Legacy telling me that no peace deal had been signed as of about two weeks ago, Legacy and Fi.re seem content to not push further into this region. Now that doesn't mean that Winter is either safe or content to accept the current state of affairs forever, and coalition updates from Norris seem to indicate that he is looking for a new home for the group to either move to or fight to take over in 2020. It's currently unknown where this will be, and interestingly, what parts of Winter will stay as a part of the Coalition post-defeat, as previous groups that had aligned with them such as Vindictive, and if unverified Reddit rumours are to be believed, Iron Crown, have left the Coalition. For its own part, Fraternity is doing its best to rebuild after the war, absorbing several corporations from Coalition members The Therapists and Iron Crown to replace the slow drain of numbers that normally occurs during wartime, as people who are members of the Alliance for purely PvE reasons are driven out of the Alliance as hostile PvPers target them. And despite the interstitial situation that they find themselves in currently, Winter hasn't simply curled up into inactivity, and one of the most fascinating things to see is that Winter and Army of Mangoes, a Chinese group in Omist which is marked here as on the Legacy banner due to their close ties despite technically being separate, have continually been fighting one another due to their time zone and size similarity, as well as I'm sure some measure of grudge, given the relationship that both sides had with one another on Serenity. Now if you're interested in taking a short read on the history of Serenity to help understand how that ties back into tranquility politics right now, I'd recommend taking a read of the article I wrote on the topic on MMORPG.com, which I'll link in the description. Sorry to show my other work, but it's kind of too complex to simply TLDR here. Anyway, I imagine these clashes will continue until Fraternity and the other alliances that follow them move far enough away from Mangoes for it to be viable, which isn't guaranteed to even happen, meaning that some aspect of the Legacy Winter War will be kept very much alive, although these fights don't seem to be built around contesting objectives for the most part, with both sides simply heading to where they know the other is with a fleet, and to some degree just demanding satisfaction, like knights of old throwing down their gauntlets. The main focus for Legacy and Fi.re has, as mentioned earlier, shifted from the act of driving Winter back and securing strategic key choke points, and more to beginning to solidify their influence over their new gains, with the regions of Scolding Pass and Innsmother remaining contested by various smaller groups, who had either moved in after Winter had begun their retreat, or had held territory in the area for some time, such as Toilet Paper, and amazingly, a revived Space Monkeys Alliance. Winter has made minimal to no defensive presence in these regions following their move back to Cache. Now, Detorid had seemingly been the focus of a more organised attempt to cause pain to this consolidation, with the Horde Sig partisans having been active in the area, that deployment, however, doesn't seem to have generated any battle reports that have come to my attention at least, so I'm unaware of if it continues to the present day or what's really going on with regards to that deployment. But given that Legacy and Fi.re have managed to attain full control over the region and no solve timers have been generated there in the past few days, I assume that it is relatively pacified by now. 
However, if someone has conflicting information, feel free to throw it at me. Taking a look further away from the war zone, most of Legacy's core territories are relatively peaceful, although that is ultimately a relative term, and we do see fights such as the one that broke out in x one tac iz 0 on Monday over the final timer of a synergy of Steel Fortizar in Innsmother, where Legacy and Fi.re attempted to defend the objective whilst Panfam contested it leading to a relatively even 900 person fight with plenty of eagles and munins on both sides, as well as a few nightmares and capitals from Panfam, which helped them overcome a slight numbers disadvantage and take both the objective and the victory in the Isk War, with Panfam losing 33 billion and killing 49, including the targeted Fortizar. And this kind of serves to highlight the subjectivity of trying to report on EVE, where conflicts aren't always focused or officially announced, as the argument could be made that this is Panfam actively continuing a war with Legacy, but it's more likely just to be a place where both sides mistakenly thought they had an easy victory at hand, and as such, personally, I don't consider this to be a major war act, and more just a regular border skirmish. And if you think differently, hey, that's okay. I just wanted to kind of use this to highlight stuff that I don't talk about, although it will normally be on a smaller scale, because there's pretty much always border friction between alliances in EVE that aren't directly blue. Regardless, let's take a look at what I consider to be the next region at war as we trawl the map, Providence. Now, as I talked about in a video all the way back in August, Providence has kind of been at war since early 2018, just with varying levels of intensity, as the anime war's progression saw the Wrecking Crew Coalition capture Waitak MP and held it through the Legacy Reconquista, giving them a perfect launching off point to attack the Proviblock Coalition. This has allowed them to take a constellation and a half in the north of the region, and ensured that every month or two, the local groups will just come to blows, either as Wrecking Crew probe a system near their current holdings, or Provi Block attempts to reclaim one of their lost systems. Although really, the objectives don't have to matter a huge amount, with the largest fight of the year being between the two starting over a Poco, which is a hilariously meaningless objective in comparison to the 200 billion ISK that ended up dying over it, as I don't think the return on investment on a 200 billion ISK Poco can be represented in human measurements of time. Still, these two coalitions are not alone in the region, with Federation Uprising having deployed to ERVK and Catch and moved to attack Provi Block themselves, as Provi Block is neutral to the Legacy Coalition, which Fed Up are a part of. This has led to these newcomers to the conflict and Wrecking Crew working together, as was seen on the 10th of November, where they both coordinated during an attack on the Provi Block Jump Bridge network in KBP, AP9, and VKI. This led to a drawn out multi system fight between the two sides, with We Form Volta and Get Off My Lawn attempting to aid Provi Block in their defence. The attackers, though, were able to seize the victory in the Isk War and a partial objective victory, killing 9 billion Isk whilst losing 2 and killing some but not all of the reinforced jump gates. If you thought things would settle down with just one new entrant though, you'd be sadly mistaken as Tactical Supremacy, an alliance which recently left Legacy and its Sov in catch behind to become independent again, has become active in the region. And whilst I don't know their current staging system, or if they intend to attack Probably Block on the same scale that Wrecking Crew and Fed Up have, I do know that this complicates the political situation somewhat as it's rumoured that Tickle intend to take holdings in Providence and then use them to harass Legacy's home front. And with their history with Plovry Block that I described in my last news video, making it unlikely that they'll facilitate that peacefully, this makes it more difficult for FedUp to help Wrecking Crew destabilise Plovry Block, as whilst Wrecking Crew is to some vague extent Legacy aligned, given their cooperation over the Keepstar and nearby Losec, if Tickle isn't, then giving them the room that they need to become a problem really isn't in their or Legacy's best interests. 
Still, these are rumours, and the only reason I actually bring it up is that FedUp has recently announced a second deployment to Scalding Pass in order to deal with SMA. Again, not entirely unusual, but it does make it look to me like they're attempting to pivot away from this war now whilst Tickle's intentions are unclear. No matter what the political situation ends up being after all of this shakes out and the sides become a little more crystallised though, I expect fighting to continue in this region almost indefinitely whilst Wrecking Crew and Provi Block retain a presence in the area, so it will continue to be one I keep an eye on going forwards. And if you're looking to third party, I'd suggest you do too, as it's easily possible to have an impact on the fights here with sub-50 people zipping in through a wormhole, as shown rather clearly by Volta's presence in the theatre, as well as groups you don't traditionally associate with projecting their power onto random fights for fun, such as the Imperium assisting Providence in a fight in 9UI this last Tuesday. Zooming out to take a look at the wider map again, it's also somewhat clear why you don't see the Imperium in too many of these flashpoints, given that they're surrounded by allies, although not technically blues, on both sides, meaning that their external borders are about as safe as one can feasibly make them. But the lack of an apparent way for a nullsec power to directly challenge the Imperium in the field shouldn't be mistaken for exactly the same thing as peace and much as the lion or the elephant in the Serengeti has to deal with flies and scavengers picking away its food, so too does the Imperium have a number of continual small conflicts to handle within its own borders, and whilst calling them wars might be stretching the definition a little, they certainly bear mention. The first area of note in that regard is Quirius, in which the Imperium doesn't hold direct control over many of the systems that don't form a core part of the intra-delve jump range, instead ceding it nominally to the Quirius Fight Club, which is a rotating band of new and old alliances which are allowed to set up in the region with the Imperium's blessing, with the stated intention of helping them to build and allowing the Imperium to have a playground of neutral locals with which to spar against. One of the downsides to this arrangement is that as these smaller alliances are nominally independent, hostile groups have an easy time at picking away at the territories of this subsidiary coalition when the Imperium is distracted. And as we talked about in our last update, Darwinism is one such group. Having battled with the Imperium for two years from their basing in Carnid, taking Sov and eventually being pushed back when the Imperium has nothing else to do in a protracted cycle. Now, this doesn't present a strategic threat to the Imperium, but it does render the QFC a much diminished entity, as it rarely serves as a good place for alliances to grow, at least from my external observations, given the amount of camping, baiting, and dropping of capitals that these hostile forces present to the region, overwhelming groups that often need peace time to recuperate, which is probably the reason for their willingness to crash on the Imperium's proverbial couch. This denies the Imperium any strong allies that could potentially be generated from the region, and provides Darwinism with all the content they're looking for, as the inevitable supercapital tide that will wash away all their presence in the region eventually doesn't seem to bother them after it's retreated, and they can go back to preying on the locals again. The other major hotspot in the Imperium's territory shares that aspect of not being under a strategic threat per se, but operates at a much larger scale, and centres in the heart of their economy, Delve. Here we find several groups that are trying to use the NPC Nullsec in this region as a base from which to disrupt the Imperium, by trying to snipe various crabbing assets like Rorquals and Supers out from underneath the larger supercapital umbrella that operates in the region. The most well known of these groups is Delve Pest Control Incorporated, which consists of many prominent whalers such as Marshy and Olmeca Gold, as well as FCs from various other groups such as Volta and Horde. This group was given a huge boon recently as a well known FC in the Imperium known as Pitts left the Imperium under, let's just say, interesting circumstances following a failed dread bomb. In the aftermath of this, he got in contact with DPCI and gave them insider knowledge into the organisation of the Imperium's so-called Locust Fleets, 
huge groups of rock halls which are dragged through system after system to strip mine Athenors, supported by super capitals and facts. That knowledge, combined with just shy of 100 dreads, was enough for the DPCI to make the first ever successful attack on one of these fleets, killing 58 rock halls and destroying 415 billion isk, whilst losing only 176 of their own. Big blowout battles like this are decidedly not the norm though in this home front, with them more commonly being a handful of dreads thrown at a rock hall that got bubbled off a gate, or other targets of opportunity in similar vulnerable situations. But those are often difficult to weave into a news narrative, so don't expect to hear a great deal about delve burning in more topical updates, but keep in mind that there's always going to be some attrition going on in that region, and pretty much any other highly crabbing focused area, no matter what's officially going on in the wider political scene. Finally, there is one other place that caught my attention on the very fringes of the Imperium's territory to the north, where it shares a border with Deadco and the smaller Galmil Stan coalition of GMVA and Penn is out. I had originally seen a number of reinforced TCUs, which made me think that some form of war was brewing, either between the Imperium and Galmilistan, or with Galmilistan against some outside force. However, after following it up with the locals, it appears that this is predominantly just sort of trolling due to the low ADMs present across the region. So whilst some form of attack is being laid on the region, it doesn't seem like anyone has any grand designs here right now. Looking just across that border, as I mentioned, we see the start of the territory of the next major coalition, Dead Coalition, which still holds onto the same space they've held in the north since the resolution of World War B. However, this territory has not been unchallenged, as we saw with the huge clashes between Dead Coalition and Snuffed Out earlier in the year, which led to what will now almost certainly be the biggest battle of 2019 in 01Y. Looking at Fade now, we see that the war which spawned that battle has actually lived on past Snuffed Out itself, which disbanded recently, with the small Pure Blind Alliance United Federation of Conifers having taken advantage of Snuffed Out's attacks in the region, using the distraction to conquer most of a constellation in the east of it with their allies, that intersects with their home territory in Pure Blind, and gives them a route deeper into Dead Coalition's ratting grounds in decline. Dead Coalition has made some effort to retake this lost constellation, reinforcing structures and systems fairly easily. However, due to the time zone difference between the two, with UFC being primarily USTZ and Dead Coalition AUTZ, as well as the obvious size disparity, battles have been relatively rare. As a result, pretty much no progress has been made by either side, as UFC seems content to sit on their holdings for now, utilising them to harass the surrounding regions rather than as a launching off point to try and take more systems. Another reason playing into Deadco's lack of a determined effort to clean up the aftermath in Fade is another, more pressing concern on the opposite side of their territory in Tinal, where Panfam forces, primarily NC Dot, Veni Vidi Vici, and the Stars of the Northern Moon are leading an assault on the region. The initial push into the region was relatively successful, with the attackers taking the entire constellation and making inroads into several others. However, since then, progress has begun to slow, as you can see by the back and forth stretching across November, with Ranger Regiment repeatedly losing and then regaining systems. The war so far has mostly focused around subcat fighting in the Asian or AU time zone, as both Deadco and NC Dot have their supercapital fleets stationed in range of the fighting, making it difficult for either side to commit a heavy capital presence without having to prepare to escalate to a full supercapital fight, which means that the presence of supercapitals paradoxically limits their usage. The primary objectives being focused on here are Keepstars and iHubs, as the slow grind that we saw in Detorid, where the attacker has to slowly poke holes in Deadco's Jammer Umbrella in order to push forwards, whilst trying to bait out bigger keystone fights around structures that they can call in allies for. Whilst the defender has to sit back, draw a line in the sand, 
and simply see if they can hold on for longer than the attacker is willing to continue running into a brick wall for. One interesting factor about VVV and MSN, NCDOT's Chinese allies in this campaign, is that they were both some of the last groups to move across from Serenity, putting them at a significant development disadvantage when compared to others like Winter, Ranger Regiment, or even Army of Mango. And this, in turn, leads to them bringing some interesting doctrines that try and maximise the amount of effectiveness that they can squeeze out from the limited SP of their members and is why we see them fielding these hull tanks Dominix fleets, which allows them to set up ratting ships parallel to a main combat doctrine. Whilst these are certainly not the most optimal ships to be flying in the modern meta, whilst these are certainly not the most optimal ships to be flying in the modern meta, it is a really interesting adaption to see, and it has exceeded my admittedly very, very low expectations of their battlefield efficiency. Overall though, Tino seems to me like the region which will see the most combat over the first few months of 2020, so I will be continuing to keep a very close eye on it. Players involved in the conflict should also feel free to continue sending me battle reports, updates, and whatever else you feel like sharing from the front line here. And if people can record and put up footage of the fights, that would be awesome, as I always love to see that. Anyway, just below Dead Coalition, we have the collection of regions that I like to term the Near North, in Pure Blind, Tribute, and Vale of the Silent, which were abandoned by Panfam earlier in the year, and have since become hotbeds of conflict as new alliances moved in to fill the power vacuum, including Trigger Happy, the alliance that I'm currently a member of. I mention this every time we cover this area, but as someone fighting here directly, my coverage of it will come with a certain degree of bias, as it's not like those fighting against me will be willing to share an honest assessment of the balance of power and internal politics that led to the current situations, and understandably so. Although I will thank the many people who've been gracious enough to DM me with offers to try and offset that. For now though, let's just cover the dry facts of what I'm involved in, which is the conflict between Trigger Happy and their allies against the Pure Blind Madness Coalition. The flashpoint which started this was conflict over the ownership of the GORV TAC P constellation in Tribute, which borders Pure Blind. And this was originally held by Bandalogs, but as Trigger Happy and its allies grew and Senti became less of a viable target due to the repeated intervention of Triumvirate, their attention turned to this area of space instead, leading to repeated subcap skirmishes and occasional dread escalation. However, Trigger Happy eventually came out on top and took control of the area, as you can see now, and that led to them pushing deeper into Pure Blind, specifically towards the NPC space in the core of the region. And this has led to an intensification of resistance from the wider Pure Blind Menace Coalition, as all of the alliances in the coalition are now theoretically under threat. And this has led to fights such as the Dread Brawl that I was a part of in AS TAC. This content has also drawn in several other third parties looking for content, with the Panfam Alliance Triumvirate deploying to Venal and the Imperium Space Violence SIG having joined them putting further potential threats or allies onto the field for both sides, depending on what the exact situation is. Looking over to the Vale of the Silent, we have another fragmented region that's been undergoing a civil war, as the DEF Coalition of Forsaken Empire, Reverberation Project and Divinity broke apart a month or so ago, whilst the Pet Coalition of Roque Capel, Unspoken Alliance and their allies have continued to attack from their holdings in tribute. Forsaken Empire and Reverberation Project are now working together to try and push Divinity out of the region, who have begun working with the Lord of Worlds Alliance, a former Winter Coalition member, to solidify their position in East Vale, whilst also occasionally having the support of Slice and other nearby Panfam forces. I sadly haven't been able to dig through and find any representative battle reports for this rapidly escalating civil war, but I hope that they'll start to pop up soon. Oh, and as if that wasn't enough factions to bear in mind, Predators, a test alliance SIG, has recently deployed to OBE, the low-sec system in Forge which directly borders Vale. What exactly their intentions are here is currently unknown, as they've only just moved into the theatre, but I'm sure it will do nothing but complicate the picture. 
In short, the Near North is a dumpster fire of conflict right now, but that is exactly where I want to be, so I find myself quite happy with the situation personally. Moving on from there, we find ourselves at the final geopolitical area to discuss, the rather expansive Panfamed aligned territories in the northeast. Much like with the Imperium's holdings, these are mostly pacified, although their borders are not nearly as friendly. After all, they are actively invading Tinal right now, and their previous allies in Winter Coalition have been pushed back to barely holding a thin line of separation between their borders and that of the Legacy Aligned and Anti-Panfam FI.RE Coalition. The main region that we've previously seen being attacked by hostile forces is Gemina, owing to the NPC Nullsec in the region, which the Imperium had previously used to stage a special interest group from, leading to numerous capital clashes between themselves and Horde as they attempted to clear the Goonswarm Citadels from the area in response. Since that formative period though, several other smaller alliances have come to reside near that area of space, after Horde uh, relocated deeper into Panfam territory, and I haven't seen any fights pop up on my radar since from this region. I don't know if that's a result of the fighting becoming more dispersed, or if the Imperium Sig has moved elsewhere, but I expect that given time, we'll start to see more harassment operations spring up in other regions around the northeast. A hilarious recent example of something like that bearing fruit is the operation that Volta pulled off in Oasa, where they were able to bubble a small group of therapist titans in their support and trap them on field with the so-called diamond rats, which then proceeded to eat the titans and their hastily dropped support faxes alive, killing two of them, before enough support could arrive and actually push these sabers away. Anyway, that wraps up the picture of Nullsec Warfare, but it's worth mentioning that we do see battles in every area of space, it's just that the long-term shifting of power and control is a hell of a lot easier to track in Nullsec, as it's difficult to live in the same space as someone else, which is less the case in Lowsec and Highsec. And also the scales of fights tend to be a lot larger on average in Nullsec. So, whilst I have the opportunity, let's take a look at some of the bigger fights that broke out in those more uncovered regions over the course of the past few weeks. The first of these takes place in the System of Heck in Mimitar Highsec, which is host to many groups as it's one of the secondary trade hubs in Mimitar space. But the most important one for this particular story is the Hog Hitmen a Highsec Wardek alliance that predominantly focused on interdicting Nullsec tr traffic through Highsec, as can be seen from their extensive killboard. This requires them to have Wardeks with a wide swathe of Nullsec alliances, and as a result of the Wardek changes, these had to be tied to a particular structure. In this case, they all came from one Fortazar in the aforementioned system. Noting this, Vindictive, along with a few other Wardect entities, work together to reinforce this structure, eventually bringing it to a final timer, which led to both sides calling everyone they could in to decide the objective, as if the Fortazar fell, all the Wardecks would end. For this final timer, Hog Hitmen were backed up by Pirate, Wrecking Machine, Apocalypse Now, and others, whilst the attacking forces were a complete hodgepodge of everyone from everywhere, but predominantly Vindictive, Black Legion, and Intergalactic Space Hobos. Overall, nearly 400 people crammed into the system, leading to 49 billion in losses for the Wardeckers, and 42 billion for the Wardeckies, and crucially, killing the Fortazar, securing the end of all of the wars for now. The most amusing thing of all of this, though, is seeing players from such opposing factions as Brave Newbies and Pandemic Legion working together to fight in a battle like this, and I wonder if it's something we'll see more of in the future, as Nullsec entities become more aware of the potential of actively fighting off war decks rather than just passively accepting them. The other place that's seen heavy action is the region of Black Rise, where a fight began to brew in the system of Marteau, as a Templus Calcif Astra House began to tick out of its final timer, having previously been reinforced by nearby Galmalistan forces, that primarily consist of Pen is Out and GMVA. 
who arrived to this final tarmac in a Macario fleet and were met in the field by a opposing coalition of forces, including Federation Uprising, Aggressively Average, United Federation of Conifers, Dock Workers, Templars Calcif, Intergalactic Space Hobos, and many others that you can read for yourself, who formed a mix of Macarios and Lokis themselves. The two sides clashed in a predominantly subcap based engagement for the first few minutes of the encounter, with only Apostles being present to provide triage support for the Macarios on both sides. But as the fight wore on and the attacking force began to feel the pressure, they decided to escalate, committing a force of dreads in an attempt to kill the defenders' facts and thus cripple their ability to stay in the fight. The defenders, however, countered this with a larger dread force of their own, along with the anti-cap missiles of the Astra House, and ended up killing both the attacking forces' fax and trading well against the opposing dreads, whilst their own fax was able to survive, forcing the attackers to in fact retreat from the field and leaving the Astra House to live for another day. All in all, this battle left the attackers with 93 billion Iskin losses and the defenders with 35. Now a few other things outside of the actual EVE Online video game bear mentioning as well, as a lot of cool things have gone down in the community that surrounds the game in the past few weeks, especially in the space of streaming, where Johnny Splunk created a Twitch project which allowed the chat to control the actions of a client, leading to a hell of a lot of fun, much in the same way as Twitch Plays Pokemon was as people fought for control over the character, died in hilariously stupid ways, and perhaps more amazingly, even managed to get a solo PvP kill. All of this led to the creator winning the grand prize for Twitch's 2019 Dev Jam, which is an absolutely amazing achievement, and I'm sure he'll go on to do even greater things going forwards. Good job, man. Alongside that, Streamfleet organised a Take this a -thon, which involved 57 hours of consecutive streaming by various different EVE broadcasters, including myself, to raise money for the charity Take This, which aims to raise both awareness and help deal with mental health issues in the games industry and in gaming communities, which is an awesome cause. Whilst the exact total uh, raised hasn't been made publicly available as far as I'm aware, through direct donations alone, the community raised over $10,000 for charity in just a few days, going just a little bit towards showing that the reputation of EVE players as cold, heartless bastards might be just a bit of a facade. I'd encourage you to go and check out the charity's website in the description below in case you want to find out more about what they do and see if there's any ways you too can support them. And finally, I just wanted to welcome back the NER to the EVE media scene, as its 1900 news updates had been silent for a fair few months, and understandably so. I know that this isn't exactly an easy job to fulfil. If you want a different source to compare and contrast against my own reporting, I recommend you give them a look, as I've always enjoyed what they've put out personally. Even if my sources have sometimes told me a different story, which is just part of the game that we're playing here and that about wraps it up. So a special thanks as always goes out to our Crassuses, Pinche Infidel from Old School, Brood from Triumvirate, and Zolka Lando, as well as to our other $5 patrons in Dustin Prater, Crazy Daisy, Zar, Olav Aldent, Kem, Raphael, Big Bada Boom, Dunk Dinkle, and the Ashfell Federation. If you want to support the channel yourself, you can either check out the Patreon link in the description below, or if you'd like, just subscribe and share the video with some other people who you think might enjoy it. Until next time, have a good day and fly smart.